Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use the mic because we're also Zooming this and uh, the mic is part of that. So welcome everybody, it's great to see you here. We have an exciting evening. I'm really looking forward to this. And, but I do want to uh, remind you about some things that are happening that Peregrine Audubon is uh, excited to share with you and invite you to share in the activities. Um, we have coming up kind of a, a different schedule. Uh, rather than our regular meeting time, our next gathering, our next program will be December 11th, which is a Monday. And that's going to be uh, getting to know your local birds and signing up for the Christmas bird count. So if you're if you're at all interested in birds, I encourage you to participate in the Christmas bird count because it's just fun. We have different groups going different places and on the 11th, you'll hear all about that. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to get out and uh, see what's in our county and at least this part of our county in our, our account circle. So uh, um, there is going to be a special group for beginners and uh, as part of the Christmas bird count. Now the Christmas bird count itself will be on the 16th. We call it the CBC, the Christmas bird count. We do it every year. And uh, uh, we have been doing it for, I don't know how many years, lots of years. And it goes into a database for, um, it's, it's a worldwide database now. And uh, uh, you can access it uh, online uh, and you'll find out more about that on the 16th. We also on the 16th have a potluck at the Grace Hudson public room that uh, everybody who participates in the Christmas bird count is invited to come. And that will be at 530 and we'll announce that again on the 16th. Our January and February programs will not be in person. They're going to just be Zoomed because it's winter and we figured maybe we won't uh, we won't have those in person. We'll give people a chance to stay home, have a nice glass of wine and watch our programs online. Um, and then the January program is, uh, is going to be, uh, the Zoomed program will be Carla Bloom from the International Owl Center and she'll be doing a special program on owls. And then February 20th, uh, we'll have a very special scientist that's studying monarch butterfly caterpillar predators. And she's going to be doing a program, which is uh, sounds really interesting. And then in January, we have a trip to the Sacramento Wildlife Refuge, which we want to invite you all to participate in. Um, now. Are there any other announcements from anybody? I want to get on and introduce our speaker, Art Haschek. <laughs> and Art knows probably more about falcons than, well, certainly anybody I know and anybody in our county. He's been, he's been a falconer for over 50 years. And uh, so he has a very special relationship with falcons. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about falcons and what you do are from, from you. So thank you so much for being here.
All right. So can you hear okay? So, um, yeah, one guy, uh, Glenn, my friend, um, spent the first part of his career uh, with Harris's Hawks down along the Colorado River, and then he went up to Prince William Sound to catch and de-oil bald eagles from the Exxon Valdez disaster and finished his career, you know, saving peregrines on the West Coast. So all these guys have are like really into it and so anyway um last time i was here we talked about just general bird identification i mean identification of raptors and how you could tell a hawk from a falcon and this time i wanted to just focus on the falcons and um so I started to do research on this and I was like, this is all stuff anybody could find on the internet, you know? So it's not, I, I thought maybe what would be more of more interest to you all would be um, just what's it like, what are, what are the different Falcons like when you live with them and, and hunt with them and, and spend your life with them? And like, um, like my introduc introducer said, um, I've been doing this since I was 17. This, this picture here is when I was 32 and I had been flying birds for 15 years at this point. Um, so I've been doing it for over 50 years now. And, um, and tonight we'll talk about the, just the falcons we have in this country. So most of you probably know a lot of this, but we have six different species that in um, America. We have, um, let's see here. <clears throat> so we have kestrels, that's the smallest of the falcons. And it's actually one of the smallest falcons in the world. Um, Aplomato falcons, they, they just barely peek into this country in Texas. Merlins, this is kind of an interesting picture because it shows these ground nesting Merlins. Prairie falcons, peregrines, and jeers. I've only flown two kestrels and I've never flown an Aplomato or a Jeer, so we'll be focusing a little more on prairies, peregrines, and merlins. This is not a good place to put this. <laughs> Let's see here. But first, I wanted to talk about hunting techniques. Forgive my artistry here. But, um, so hunting techniques, all the falcons do most of these techniques, except for hovering, which is really just a kestrel thing. But um, from a perch, all the falcons will hunt from perches. 
Some of them are specialized in tail chasing and you know direct pursuit. Merlins especially, but jeer falcons also. This is ground coursing where they use the terrain to hide themselves as they speed along the ground and trying to surprise things at the last second. And stooping is what peregrines are known for, but all of them will do it. Um, but that's, you know, where they, <clears throat> they go up really high. That's called a pitch, how high they go. And when they're at their pitch, they're waiting on over your head. And then the ringing flight. And the ringing flight is something really Merlins do the best. It's where they try to outclimb a bird or try to force it higher and higher into the sky and then get above it and stoop at it, bring it back, you know, catch it on the way back down. So the first bird is a kestrel, and these are just the greatest little birds. Um, they, hang on a sec, <laughs> get my paperwork here. So kestrels hunt mostly from a, a perch, but they do hover also and, and hunt, but they're hunting insects mostly in rodents, but they will catch small birds. And they're, they're a perfect little falcon. I mean, everything, that, these bigger falcons do, a kestrel is, I mean, they just, they're a falcon. And and um, falconers don't fly them much because they've got bigger birds to work with, but they, when they do, they hunt, usually hunt house sparrows with them. And um, here's a male. These are pictures of males mainly. With, with kestrels, the males and females look different. And, and, and with merlins, they look different too, but the other falcons all look exactly alike. The only way you can tell the difference is by their size. Like a female is much bigger than a male. There's a female kestrel. And even kestrels stoop, just like any other falcon. Now the Apomato falcon is interesting in that they weren't even considered a bird to be used in falconry for the first 30 years I was flying birds. And, and which is funny because 400 years ago, Spanish explorers brought back some falcons from the new world and they called them the Aleth falcon. And there was whole articles written about what is the Aleth falcon? You know, what are they talking about? Because they just raved about these falcons they found in the new world. And it wasn't until about 20 years ago that we figured out it was Apomato falcons. And the Apomatos are the preferred bird nowadays for um, bird abatement projects where falconers are hired to keep starlings out of vineyards and out of blueberries and um, off of airports. And so that's like become a thing now where people actually make a living just chasing starlings around. And, and Apomatos are the best at it. They just are relentless chasers. You know, they once they get on something, they don't give up. And um, they're really kind of an aberrant falcon in that they have a, a long tail and, and more rounded wings. They're almost like a Cooper's hawk that acts like a falcon. I mean, they're just, they're uh, super persistent and fearless and and also like just really nice birds or little tame birds or they uh and, and obviously quite beautiful birds They're quite a bit bigger. I don't know the weights on them though, since I've never flown one. But if 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 you were to look at size, it'd be kestrels, then merlins, then apomatos. Op, they'd be between a merlin and a prairie falcon weight and weight. 
So this is a Merlin and um, that's it. So Merlins are really my first love in falconry. I've only flown three of them. Um, and but some falconers spend their whole life just flying Merlins. I mean, they're that good. They're they're and they're they're unusual in that um, nobody really captive breeds them because they're fairly common in the wild, and and they come down out of Canada and Alaska into the in the United States in the uh, in the winter. So falconers are basically just trapping merlins, taming them flying them for the winter and then letting them go in the in the springtime and um a, a good friend of mine in utah had a bird that every year he'd let it go in the spring and every year it would come back in the fall to the exact same tree and i'm sure that bird was going up to canada raising a family and coming back to utah and he did it for six years in a row um, where he just basically he'd trap the bird because they would get a little wild in the summer, you know, going through a whole summer without being handled. Trap the bird, spend a few days getting it used to him again, and go back out and start hunting it. And at the end of the at the end of the season, you just leave it in the tree that night and not take it home. And a few days later, it'd be gone. Right? Um, but they're they're super efficient and every other hawk knows it and they steal from them so the merlins are constantly looking over their shoulders you know they're like when they catch something they like to go into a bush and, and to eat it because they if a marsh hawk or anybody sees them with a bird they, they they're small and they will get you know robbed and they're so good they're one of the few birds well i'll show you a picture in a second of them on starlings uh so this is a columbarius. We have three types of merlins um, in this country. And, um, the columbarius is the most common that we see around here. Uh, they're a, sort of a medium color and medium size. This is a this would be a Richardson's merlin, and Richardson's are more Saskatchewan down through the Great Plains. And they're a bigger bird. And from what I've heard, they're a little more, I've never flown a Richardson's, but they have a little more of an attitude. But generally, Merlins are super sweet birds. Another Richardson's from the back. And this is a black, and we have black Merlins come through here now and then. Um, they're like British Columbia forest Merlins. No, even none of the none of the falcons make their own nests. You know, they they'll use the nest of a raven or a crow or an eagle. And like I said, they're they're masters of the direct pursuit. I mean, they just you know. In fact, there's a there's an old falconry saying that. If you see a small falcon and you're like going, is that a kestrel or a merlin? It's a kestrel. Because when you see a merlin, you know it's a merlin. I mean, they're that like, oh, that's a merlin. You know, it's just like you just, they're so much more dynamic than a kestrel in flight. And they're one of the few birds. Now, this is, these are look like they might be peregrines. And peregrines will do this too. But if you see a, a a group of starlings ball up, and you'll see it around here, I'm sure. Keep look at it close because there's usually a merlin in there somewhere, and that's they don't ball up for no reason. They're like they're afraid. Merlins pretty much follow the starlings down from the north, you know, when winter hits. I mean, they're like, it's kind of like barracudas with sardines or something, you know, they have like this relationship with them.
So this is a prairie falcon on a snipe. This is a, a painting, of course. And I spent a lot of time flying prairies uh, in Willets in my younger years. And prairies are, during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when peregrines had been declared endangered and captive breeding hadn't really gotten going yet, um, this is what we flew. Prairie falcons are like a substitute for the peregrine. They're very similar, but they're, you know, they're a desert falcon and they are known in the falconry world as like really hard hitting birds. I mean, the peregrines are almost considered wimps in comparison. And I think that comes from when you live in a desert, you know, and your opportunities are fewer, few and far between, you make every, you know, hit count. So I love prairies. Uh, the females are a little, a little bit tougher to live with than the, the males. The males are real sweet birds. And I've, I had two males I flew for six years. They were only found in North America, so they were unknown to falconers, you know, to, in the old world. And they, they, they'll stoop from high pitches, just like a peregrine, um, but they, they um, also will course along the ground, especially along the Snake River, where they, there's like a couple hundred pairs of peregrines that live along the Snake River, and they hunt ground squirrels during the breeding season, and they'll just like, all ass along the ground, really fat, you know, like around the hills and stuff, and just trying to surprise a ground squirrel away from its hole. This this is a distinctive thing with prairies. If you see a falcon overhead, you know the shape, but all you're seeing is you're not seeing it very well. You, the, the, the dark armpits will tell you that it's a prairie falcon. The old male is really a gorgeous bird, like this this bird here. That's an immature bird. So the jeers, I'm skipping peregrines for now. Um, the jeers are the largest of the falcons. They're a big Arctic falcon, and they spend most of their life in the Arctic. But in in harsh winters, they'll be driven this far south. Um, they come in three colors. There's the grays, and a black, and a white. There's these, falconers also consider it. There's a silver, but it's kind of like has to do with the edging on their on a white coat for a bird. So jeers are like giant merlins, really. I mean, they're. They're direct pursuit birds. They live on ptarmigan, um, which is, you know, a type of grouse-like bird up in the Arctic. And they fluctuate, the population fluctuates radically along with the ptarmigans. It's like on a four-year cycle. The the guy on the right is my mentor, and he was asked once, well, why doesn't he fly jeers? He lives in Idaho, and he can trap a jeer whenever he wants. And he's like, why aren't you flying jeers? And he's like, why? So I can train it to fly like a peregrine. Uh, one of the guys I was telling you about that I camped with in Montana when, was studying jeers for seven years in Greenland and they would drop them off on a, a set of cliffs and they'd say they on you know, they had boats you know and it was like they would drop them off and they'd say this cliff's 10 miles long we'll pick you up at the end of the day at the other end and he would just walk along looking for jeers and peregrines and I asked him what what the wildlife in Greenland was like and he said it's actually quite scarce you don't see much except there's these giant bird colonies, like with a million birds in them. 
you'll see this young bird. These are all young birds. And this bird will go down and pick up a dove key that's been partly eaten. And I guess these dove keys are just massive colonies of them in Greenland. Not a very good video, but. Here, it looks like they're using a raven's nest here. Yeah, I think that's white. I think the silvers have like more black and the black is edged with white. So which this finally brings us, oh, I got a little more to say on gear. Like I went up to Nome this in September. Um, a buddy of mine had a permit to trap a jeer, and I was going to go help him. I just wanted to, to see a jeer in the wild, and it was actually a down year for jeer, so we didn't get a bird, but um, I did get to see muskox, which was a goal of mine. And uh, this is in Nome, Alaska. So we're pretty high up near the Arctic Circle. This isn't a very good video, but here you can see this is a baby musk ox. And this is the ptarmigan that the jeers live on. This is kind of a funny thing. There was a jeer irie that we were told about that was on this bridge. And when we got there, we it was full of musk ox hair and, and it was like all full of fleas. And uh, the ravens had used it that year instead of the jeers. And so we cleaned it out a little bit just so that next season it will be. Am I standing in front of anybody's? View, yeah, okay. <laughs> so finally, peregrines, and there, there's two reasons that peregrines have been the bird of choice for the last four thousand years. And their personalities and the way they fly. I mean, they're just their flying style. They'll hunt like kestrels from a perch. They'll chase birds like long distances like a merlin will or a jeer. But they also will hunt from like very high altitude and put in 200 mile an hour stoops. And that's kind of what we're hoping to see when we go out. But um, the Roger Tory Peterson said, um, that man has emerged from the shadows of antiquity with a peregrine on his wrist. Its dispassionate brown eyes, more than any other bird, have been witness to the struggle for civilization from the squalid tents on the steppes of Asia thousands of years ago to the marble halls of European kings in the 17th century. This is a very dark, immature bird. These are these are obviously young birds, as so they wouldn't be laying down together like this. But they don't have any down on them. They're they're out flying around, but they're still obviously young. There's an adult bird checking this out. We have three races or subspecies in North America. This is the tundra, and the tundra bird makes a huge migration. It comes from Alaska all the way to South America every year. And whereas our local birds don't move around that much, they don't need to, but the, the tundra birds are noted for having um, very light colored heads when they're young. Here's another tundra. Now this is a anatom. This is actually this bird right here. This. Sky, my seven-year-old, and 
Um, the anatoms, which is our local bird, um, usually have kind of a pinkish background in their upper body, but not always. You'll see really light colored anatoms sometimes too. Like this bird, it's very white. And then the peels, the peels falcon is off the coast of British Columbia and they'll come down through here. I mean, you, you could possibly see one, but they're, they're the biggest of the sub of, I think 17 subspecies around the or races, I would call them around the world of peregrines. Peregrines are actually the most um, widely distributed bird and the only other birds that rival them are ospreys and ravens. Uh, you find peregrines just about everywhere except Antarctica and a few islands. Here's an interesting shot of a, a, a bird getting off, off its eggs. And then its mate coming in to replace it. And this, this is actually, this is the bird I had here 10 years ago, and she's still alive. That's Sis Sis on the right, and that's her mate behind there. You, you can't see him very well. And that's the young bird is this bird. So this is Rose. She's immature and she's seven or eight months old. But they look like that when they're four weeks old. They look like that when they're seven weeks old. I mean, that's how fast they grow. It's, a, it's incredible how, how much food they put away. And I couldn't... I have to talk about my dog a little bit because that's part of the, the team. You know, when I'm when I'm hunting uh, game birds with a peregrine, you, you, the dog is part of it. And you can see that it's an instinctive thing. It's genetics, not like anything I trained them to do. But this is, she's an English setter named Sage. And she's probably the best dog I've had in 50 years. I mean, I loved all my dogs, but she's really incredible. And you can see that the birds don't mind the, the dog, and the dog doesn't mess with the birds. I'd, I'd leave a bird in a car with a dog loose and never worry about it. I've done it for years, and they don't ever seem to mess with each other. I don't know if they recognize each other as predators or what it is. And it's really nice when you're out and your falcon catches something a long ways off, which happens usually, and your dog runs over there and hangs out with it and and um, protects it from coyotes and, and eagles and the other things that are a threat, you know, red tails. And this is my other dog that likes to graze whenever the falcon's eating. You know, he just waits for a, waits for a piece of meat to drop. So one of the great things about public land is that, you know, it's, you know, you can go on it without asking permission for one thing, but it's, there's vast areas in Montana and Idaho where, you know, there's just no fences. And fences and telephone wires are like one of the biggest threats to the birds when they're moving at 100 miles an hour, you know? So, um, so that's, I usually go there for like all of September and October. I spend in Montana flying the birds and and it's a successful season if I come home with all three birds like I managed to this year. Here's a little thing on sage pointing. 
you'll see your jerk right there and then there's a sage grouse flying off. The stiff legged walk they do when they're about ready to point is, you know, they're getting birdie. We call it getting birdie when they start to walk like that. No, they're not supposed to scare them up. You're supposed to flush them. They're just supposed to find them and point them. And if they scare them, they're like, that's not good. So sometimes it happens. The, the grouse get nervous and they stand up and start walking and the bird, the dog can't handle it, you know, and they run forward. And, and up in Montana, there's this thing going, it's called the American Prairie Preserve. and They've bought like 350,000 acres and are reintroducing buffalo. Um, their goal is three and a half million acres. You know, the, the local cowboys aren't real happy about them buying up all the ranches, but it's great. I mean, I just love, love seeing these things. This thing is like dust bathing right next to the road. When we're up there, it snows sometimes, even in September and October. This is one of my favorite places in Idaho. It's <clears throat> Eastern Idaho, North Idaho Falls. Before I had an RV, this is how we camped. It's actually quite nice. You have a wood stove in there. So this is the last thing of the, of the pictures. This is um, Dunny right here and his brother. And last year when they were young, he's a year and a half old now. But we, we do this thing called a hack. I mean, not everyone does it. It's kind of risky, but you get a superior bird by doing it. And what you do is you you put them out there when they first start flying, and this is their nest as far as they're concerned. And they've never been trained to return or anything. They just come back to it because that's where they grew up, you know. And they just hang out there during the day. We have transmitters on them, and so we can track them and see what they're doing. But they pretty much they would go out fly around go up a thousand feet and they almost always stayed right together i mean they never got more than a couple hundred feet apart Walks right over the top of them. And they're just like totally tame. I mean, they just let you pick them up and take them inside at night, you know, to protect them from great horned owls and stuff. You know, we, we'd bring them in every night, but, um, you know, we never, I mean, if you tried to call one down, it wouldn't come, you know, they just, that's like a later stage of their, their development. Um, eight weeks. Yeah, they're brothers. You can see the immature plumage. I mean, this is this is his first molt, you know. So that's what they look like when they're immature. So Dunny is the red nape shaheen, which is a it's like a Middle Eastern North African desert peregrine. Is the only way I could kind of categorize it. They they you know in in this book, if you're you're welcome to look at some. Of the, there's equipment here and there's some hoods. 
and some lures. But in this book, Falcons of the World, they they list them. Red napes are like considered to be Barbary falcons, but most falconers just think of them as small peregrines. And then once they start flying, you got to keep a close eye on them for the first couple of days. You never know if they're just going to go out and land on the in the grass. You know, I mean, they don't know anything about landing yet, and so it's it, there. There's a real risky period when they first start flying. But after a week, they're pretty much safe, you know, and they still have the eagles are always a threat. And the local prairie falcons might mess with them a little bit, but a red nape, once they get up to the speed, they're like, they can outfly just by everybody. Yeah, they would just goof around like that all day long. So it's great because, you know, they get a ton of exercise at the right age. You know, when they're just developing, that's what you want. Here's a peregrine's eye view of the world. That looks like a red nape to me. I mean, it's red in the back of the head. So that's the end of the slides. Um, I thought I'd show you the birds without their hoods on and maybe feed them a little bit and hopefully they don't make a big mess. I, I plucked some starlings so they don't spread feathers everywhere in here, but it still might make a little mess. Yeah, you can ask questions. Well, the, yeah, the, the tracking is kind of line of sight. You lose the signal if they go over a hill, but sometimes they're up so high that they can be a long ways. And like right after this bird got hacked, we hacked four um, peregrines. And one of the birds, like, went 50 miles east from the hack site to a lake. And we're, like, watching it going, you know, that's a long ways, you know. And, and then it flew 50 miles north, and it was up at the Pocatello Airport. And we're, okay, we got to go get this bird. So we're getting in the car to go get him. I mean, we gathering up our stuff, getting in the car, and we look over the birds in the path. I mean, that's how fast they move around, you know. It's like 50 miles to them is just an hour of flying, you know, a level flight. What's that? The hood? Yeah, the hoods are just to keep them quiet when stuff's happening. If I'm in, a, in the car, I don't want them thrashing around breaking feathers or anything. So, so yeah. yeah. Um, the ones I'm older than are, like, smaller than me. But the ones that are older than me are also smaller. Yeah, they won't ever get as big as you. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Oh, um, she asked how old they live. This, well, that bird that was feeding her, she's 16. And that's kind of why I got her is because um, they usually stop laying eggs about 15. They only have, I think, 50 or 60 eggs in them. And, um, and she didn't start. Sis, sis was the bird we had when I was here last time. And she was about, I guess, seven or eight years old at that point. And 
she's still alive. She's still she's down in Petaluma with uh, with her mate, and I just wanted to get one of her offspring before she stopped laying. You know, since she's sixteen, she's close to being done. But I I think you know she they really enjoy raising the babies. So this is one of her daughters. This this is uh, Sky, and she's seven. So she's in her eighth hunting season, and um, they're half sisters. So um, she's pure anon, and this this is half anon and half human from a different father. Start screaming if you hear pieces on this stuff. Oh yeah, she was okay. So yeah, I was saying this proves a, this proves an imprint. And an imprint means they are like have been raised from a really young age. The person that bred this bird wanted to have the 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 parents recycle and raise more babies. So they took the babies away really young and hand fed them. And I gave up that like 30 years ago because imprints have like certain bad habits. Hang on, I'm, I'm going to get this bird eating. So the deal with imprints is they come out really tame and that's why people like them. Well, some people like them. most people don't, most falconers don't like them anymore. It's like, yeah. but um, you can get a bird to be just as tame. I mean, this bird's really tame. Um, she doesn't like the microphone, but, uh, but the imprints don't, okay, so they, they socialize with you. They think that they're like either a human or that you're a bird. You know, there's like, they're confused about their sexuality. And um, whereas a bird that's left with their parents, even a few weeks longer, you know, like they usually won't imprint past four or five weeks of age. So, um, so we leave them with their parents and I like to leave them with the parents till they're about 10 weeks old. And they're starting to get wilder and wilder each week that goes by. They're a little bit wilder to work with when you first get them. But they get over it real quick. I mean, within a month, they're like as tame as an imprint, but they're also, they don't have any of the bad habits. And the bad habits are like screaming and um, mantling over their food. When I feed him, he may mantle, which is like they cover their food with their wings and it's, and it's kind of annoying because they jam their wings into everything and they're on the ground, they jam their tail into the ground. And so we just try to avoid that. I mean, I'll come around so you can see it. No, there's a rancher up in the Arcata Bottoms that's trapping them and gives them to me. So. I mean, and these guys each eat a starling a day. So between the three of them, they're going through about a thousand starlings a year. Is that? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. <laughs> No, it didn't. It didn't kill it itself. Um, it. Uh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, this bird would not ever kill a starling because she's just not. I don't hunt her on starlings, and she and. And, and starlings are tough. I mean, that's why there's so many starlings around. I mean, merlins are the only thing that can consistently catch them. Parag wild peregrines can catch them too. But there's a difference between a wild peregrine and, a, and you know, a bird in captivity. This bird will never be the equivalent of a wild peregrine. You know, those things, when a bird gets through its first year, it becomes a different animal because it's like been up against starvation. It knows what it means to be. If I don't catch something today, I'm going to die. It's like the difference between a city person and someone living in the Amazon, you know, a tribesman. I mean, they know they're self-reliant and, and these birds are never going to be the, at the level of a wild peregrine, no matter how much I try to give them a varied experience. So she's good. I mean, she catches stuff but it's stuff i i flush for her you know like pheasants or ducks or grouse you know let me walk her around so everyone can see her a little bit i'm i have to follow the hunting seasons you know no no quail until the first that kind of thing but they have extra long hunting seasons for falconers because they realize we don't catch as much i mean a guy with a gun can go out and and kill more grouse in a day than I'll get in a month. You know, it's just it's just not the same at all. She's gonna get down to the guts here in a second. I need to have a something to keep the floor from getting all bloody. <laughs> oh. This bird is actually, she's really just a grouse hawk. I mean, that, that's what she loves. I mean, she, if I show her duck, she's not as interested. She's, she wants grouse. And, um, yeah, a sage grouse is. A sharp tail is about her size, but a sage grouse is twice her size. Well, they knock them down and then they bite their neck. They use their, like if you're gonna be killed by a, a raptor, you wanna be killed by a falcon and not by a hawk. Because, I mean, a hawk's a general term, but like a, red tails and goshawks and cooper's hawks and sharp chins, they all squeeze their prey to death. Whereas a falcon bites its prey to death and it's very quick. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah. No, usually it's still alive. But sometimes they kill them dead in the air. It happens. It's just, it's rare. No. But it's a danger. Like, she, okay, so she had a flight this season in Montana where she came down from a thousand feet and hit a sage grouse and just stopped dead in the air. I mean, she she missed the grouse either made a move into her path of flight instead of doing a glancing blow like she'll do. She actually ran into the grouse and she fell to the ground and the grouse kept flying. Yeah, and I've seen birds. I mean, I've I saw a bird paralyzed that way once. You know that they they can kill themselves. I mean, it's a dangerous business. You know, moving that fast. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, 
she's a No, they have a building. Each each one has their own building. Yeah, they don't, you know, you don't really keep them together. You could keep a couple female peregrines together, but I wouldn't, I couldn't put the red nape in with them. Because she's a lot smaller and looks like food. <laughs> um, well, like I said, my other bird's 16 and they can live 25 years. It, it depends. Like the smaller the bird is, the shorter its lifespan. Like a sharp shin might live seven or eight years. A peregrine might live 20 to 25 years. Uh, I have a friend who's got a 34-year-old Harris's hawk. You know, so probably, yeah, I, I, I don't know. No. No, yeah, no, I don't know. They, they say eagles can live 40 to 60 years. Harris's hawks are like the only really social bird. I mean, they'll hunt in a pack in the wild. And and, and so falconers like they can go out together like because they're all, it's such a solitary sport normally. But you can take a three or four Harris's hawks out and and hunt them together. And they're really nice birds. I had a Harris hawk for 14 years and he is a great bird. Yeah, but I, I get a little bit of it. I mean, just to say I did, you know. I mean, like we eat sage grouse when we catch this. What? Yeah, I eat the bones and all. And w which is funny because the the uh, owls don't digest the bones when you pull up an owl. But when you pull up in one of their calls, there's no bones. I mean, they, di they digest them. I don't really like their swallowing the beaks. They usually cut them off. But she usually just drops them in. Yeah, I I got a new glove for this talk. I it'll be bloody in a week. Well, it's bloody tonight. What's that? It's it's unusual that you have retired birds. I mean, my sixteen year old is when she, she stopped flying when she was about twelve. You know, she just was like, I'm done. You know, and so she's just been breeding ever since. But that breeding chamber she's in is like really nice big one. It's like half the size of this room. You know? And um, but yeah, that's what we do. We just hang out. You know, Sisis, the one in that picture, I tried releasing her three times and I left her out for a month and I go out every day and throw her some food just to make sure she had enough. And she was catching some things on her own. I mean, she was actually, you know, doing it. But she would sit on fence posts right next to roads, you know, and I'm just, I was like afraid someone's going to come along and. I moved my knee. Yeah, so I had to pull her in. I was afraid someone was going to shoot her. You know, I mean, if I didn't have to worry about people, I would have left her out. But let me, I'll grab the red name. You know, he's like a pretty little guy. Yeah.
field and make their route and their park through it and their fields and stuff. And the theologians of now see that same thing as happening to that they try to tell you the gospel to them and make them believe that you are going to go through this. Well, we're at high school, right? And the kids in the school are going to be talking about all the things that are going on. And um, you can just stand and write a PE article and be more interesting. You know? I heard about this guy that got off, and he was just a kid like me at the time. And Christian Green was bringing him all the best thing I've heard when he started along the way. And he just left and got the best. Nothing really. Not, well, the band was just for life, but this guy was just a big deal. He was a big deal. Now, when he's eating his brow, you know, it's just like real good. I can. Yeah, I think she's settling down. I don't want her jumping off of that thing. It's just not really a good situation. That's why you have the hose. Without the hose, you wouldn't be able to relax. This is the one that makes noise. Him.
Okay. <laughs> so, like I said, this is a red name, shiny, shiny, good, big Arabic falcon, Arabic. Yeah. He's my, so I hunt little things with him. I hunt, you know, starling. And, Snipe and quail and doves. I mean, that's what he's for. And he is, he's good. I mean, he's like, he's a good bird. There, there are actually very few of these things bred in this country. Make sure you keep him above. So I don't make a mess of you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> you're right in the line. Is it? That is not the That's the best darling. So you think that he's in his adult plumage, but you can tell it's his first molt because you see the brown feathers on his back. No, you That's what he would look like. His whole body looked like that last year. <laughs> So, like, if you see an adult bird and you see immature feathers, you know they've only gone through one molt. The right? second molt, they'll be clean. You know, they'll have all adult plumage. And you can, you, he, his chest and legs are really clean. I mean, he's got maybe one or two feathers left from his mature plumage. How many molts? Another balcony in Washington. Yeah. The question is how many molts? This one, they molt from the, from the summer. Is that his first meal for this? Yeah. And, and he really doesn't need a whole starling every day. <laughs> you know, I mean, that'll, he won't need to eat much tomorrow. That's quite a bit of food for him. Well, I've got three, and that's. Probably too, too many. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this last time I was here. But, um, the old falconer saying is one bird, one wife, two birds, no wife, <laughs> three birds, no life. <laughs> it's really true. I mean, I, I mean, if I wasn't retired, I couldn't do three birds. I mean, it's, I mean I'm constantly. Taking care of them, moving them around, flying them, find just it, it really is, depends on like where you live and, and if you can find slips for them. Slips are like situations where they can hunt. And it's just becoming harder and harder, you know, with the way the environment's you know going downhill and to find enough to hunt with them. So luckily a little bird like this is easier than the big bird, you know. There's more little things about it. <laughs> yeah, <it's okay. laughs> I, no, not really. I, I mean, they will. <laughs> Woodpeckers have an interesting strategy. They'll do this like these birds in midair. They'll just like 90 degrees, not like, turn around and go the opposite direction where they're being chased. And they're really good at getting away. <laughs> you have any trouble finding a vet? Yeah. Yeah, I, my vet, I haven't had it, I haven't needed a vet in a long time, but um, my vet is in Roseville, and I, you know, like seven hours away, you know, that's kind of, so, and she just retired. I, I actually had an interesting story. Um, I had a bird named Maggie that what, I flew her for three seasons. And at the end of her third season, I, 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 I stupidly like take birds that I fly them when they're like fat, you know, I mean, I probably should, and they need to be hungry to come back. And, you know, she was just like overweight that day. And it was a real sunny thermally day. And she decided to go up into the sore. 
And I like it when they go into a store as long as they come back at the end of it. <laughs> and um, but they'll go super high. I mean, they'll go out of sight overhead. You know, and can't get that gizzard down. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's a pig. He he acts hungry. He acts hungry even when he's not. That's the thing about him. But um, she went into a sore, and I had this GPS telemetry on her, and but the, the battery life on those things is not very great. So I tracked her all day and left her out that night. And the next morning, I found her about 10 miles away. And I, but I couldn't get close enough to her to call her down. She was up on a mountain. You know. This is in Arcata, like Blue Lake. I started out in Blue Lake. Okay. She went over the hill to towards Bloxburg, you know. And that day, I chased her for you know eight hours and she just kept moving south and moving south and that night she spent in Laytonville <laughs> and I knew where she was but I couldn't get to her again you know like the roads weren't there to get to her and the next day she was gone and I never got I didn't get any more signals and I didn't know where it, I drove as far as Ukiah and Went up on the lookouts and never got a signal. And so I hired a plane for her. I think I did. Because you can go up in a plane and it'll like you'll get a signal much further away. And um, and so I and then I heard somebody said, "Hey, there's a paragraph on Facebook. You should check it out." <laughs> and I go on Facebook and there's a guy over in Fort Bragg who's taking a picture of a peregrine sitting on the bluffs by Noel Harbor. And it was her oh. because she had a distinct like white belly patch. I mean, like most characters don't have that. She was unusual that way. And so I called him up and he thought it was just a wild parody. He didn't even know it was coming through. But I called him up and I said, where did you take this picture? And he told me and he said, but it was like two days ago. Oh. And, uh, so I got down there and I spent the next two days driving up and down the coast trying to get her but never did see her again. Yeah. How do you usually call them in when you're when they're within range? Just food? Um, just I got a lure over there I'll show you in a second. They're just trained to a lure, but I mean this guy actually he won't even come to a lure. He just like comes to my truck. I mean <laughs> he, he knows my truck and he'll land on the top of it. Yeah. So I better have a road here. He'll come to the lure, but he doesn't actually grab the lure. He just lands next to it and lets me pick him up. I mean, this is the lure I use. And then I made this just to be fancy, but. Um, I don't know. Uh, I've never even used it. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I gave that up years ago. But I leave it to somebody else. What are these things? These are the hoods that you were in. So I'm going to cast them in the ground. Actually, you want to take that show people? <laughs> Yeah, this is like an Egyptian. I'm going around for this side, 
<laughs> yeah, that's the that's <laughs> yeah. way other way we're looking at week. Yeah. We do a close up for the people on Zoom. Sure. Oh, so great. The will be much smaller. Yeah. <laughs> It's working, but my filming's a little seasick. <laughs> so. Hi, baby. <laughs> No, I won't make it a This guy is, he's actually my snipe specialist now. That's why I got him with that snipe. Sniper like he's top. They're super difficult. He just caught his first one right here. saw the male and the female because they're all full grown up when they leave the nest. Yeah. I forgot to show you the ball. This is uh, this is through a spotting scope from my backyard. Nice. The, the chick you will see come up and just about, uh, know if you want to be distracted. I don't want to show you. You'll see the chick pop its head up in just a minute. Yeah, that is a great view. You're done showing it? Yeah, it's about okay. oh. 40 yards down, down the back. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. So could we train when we use the light wood pepper by feeding it the peppers from its infancy and then it would attack all the specifically acorn. Yeah. You have a problem with acorn more pepper. But we messing up barns, the walls of barns and stuff. Houses. 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 Really? Yeah. 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 Our neighbors. I think yeah. for something like that, you'd want a sharp chin or a Cooper talk. Okay. You know, something that's a little like falcons are wide open spaces. You know, you need if you if you're in close to stuff, you want some a forest talk. You know, they're more maneuverable and. And Cooper's hawks are insane. They don't kill anything. I, I have a, I have sharp a big, big red arrow in my place, and lots of acorn woodpeckers. And I saw a head of an acorn woodpecker. Oh, really? On the lawn. It was 
Yeah, it was a hot. All you need, the, all you need is the beauty gun. <laughs> I can't now, now. <laughs> You don't need a bird. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier. What? How do you kill these birds? Those you get metal siding. Really? Yeah. Placing the bat. Wow. Thank you. Good looking bird. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. How do I kill the starlings? Yeah. Uh, I break their necks. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that brown down? They like brownish. They were, it was great. Why did they do it? Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Maybe I take care of it. No, I can't get Yeah, I can't believe you shot through three sterling <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, before we took out the raised bird game thing. That's the office. Yeah, they used to take the eggs out of nests and, and hatch them out, when, especially during the eggshell thinning period. Yeah, yeah, they would, they would uh, you know, put in fake eggs so the birds wouldn't abandon the nest. And then take the uh, fragile eggs out, hatch them out, and then put the babies back when they're a week or two old. And the parents would just come into the nest, and all of a sudden they got a two week old baby or three or four babies, and they're like, start feeding them. I mean, it was like, it doesn't seem to bother them to have that happen. Yeah, it worked good. Yeah, yeah, and to some degree. I mean, they, at some point, at some point, they're like actually bringing back live birds, they're not killing the birds, just letting them go. Like when the falcons. Okay, so they get to maybe six weeks of age, and they see the parents coming with food, and it becomes like a race.